Hey, uh, man, we're, we are so, like, everything's moving in a, gr- in a great direction over at the church. Um, we did have a little hiccup this week, but, man, we, we took care of it. And so right now, I want to give you some, maybe a little more specific dates that we can share with you. So next Sunday is our Serve Sunday. So that means that uh, we're going to meet up at New Covenant. Yes, outside at New Covenant. You say, can I go in and see the progress? The answer is no, you can't go in. We're going to black out the doors. You can't see nothing, all right? And so we're going to meet up there at 8.30, okay? 8.30 a.m. next Sunday morning at New Covenant. We will gather for some worship and some prayer, some, uh, some breakfast and, and some refreshments to send you out to our projects by around 9 o'clock, okay? Um, so please sign up on the app. You can go to the app or to our website, okay? It's on the events tab of the app, and it's on the connect tab of the website. We expected that more of you would sign up because it's on a Sunday and there's no sports to contend with, okay? And so please sign up. We got more projects than we've had, and so go on there. They're all listed out. We're finalizing some details of what we're going to be doing here at Providence Grove, Uh, but all those are listed on there. So go ahead and sign up for the project that you want to be a part of, and uh, meet up at New Covenant at 8.30 uh, next Sunday morning. Now, if for some reason we we built in the possibility of a rain date. So if for some reason it gets rained out, we will be right here again for worship, okay? 10 and 11.30, we'll worship again here, and then we will push our uh, Serve Sunday to October the 6th, okay? It will be a miracle, and we'll have to work all these times. So if the rain date pushes us, we will be back worshiping at New Covenant on October the 13th, all right? October the 13th will be the day. Now, if we're able to have Serve Sunday next week, and there is a miracle that happens up at the church, but I'm still believing. Y'all with me on that? I'm still believing for miracles. I keep telling our staff, and everybody like, October 6th, it's just, I've just got it in my head, right? They keep telling me I'm wrong, it's never going to happen, but I've been told that we would never reach over 400 people before in a service, and the next Sunday we had 448 people after having 390 some the week before. Yeah. So I don't mean I don't want to over spiritualize construction because I think the devil's a lot of times in construction. So, uh, but right now that that's the plan. Okay. So just pay careful attention to our email, our social media, so you can get all the details, um, and we'll just keep pushing that out. But uh, no rain will be served Sunday. Meet up at New Covenant next week. At 8:30, and then we've got our trunk or treat right around the corner at New Covenant on October the 27th from 3 to 5 uh, p.m. It's always a good time. Man, we we've been in this series where the church, and um, as we were sitting here singing, and I've thought this every week we've been here. I, I I've thought, man, like what a what a blessing it's been to be here, to be different. There, there's always value in positive change. Sometimes there's value in change we don't want because God's trying to teach us something we ain't ready to hear yet. And, and so oftentimes when, when you change your place and you change the pace of your life, that's why we fast. We fast to starve our flesh to get us out of what we're comfortable with so that we can see what God's doing that we might not have otherwise seen before. I love how the Bible talks about Jesus when he fasted for 40 days. It, it says basically what Jesus was doing was he was killing his flesh so that all he had to rely on was Jesus, was, was God, his father. And so like we, we, the devil came expecting to attack the flesh, but because Jesus had starved his flesh and it was dead, there was nothing for the devil to do with it. And so God comes in and says they strengthened him with angels. And, and so when we fast, when we change, God often speaks. And what God just spoke to me here in this moment right now, as I'm beginning to contemplate, man, I would love to take the spirit that we've had here and carry it back with us to New Covenant. This just spirit of, of, of awe and wonder about how good God is. He's so good. And, and so we, I began to think, and God brought the story of the Israelites to my mind that I've often used, and I even used it one time, and God spoke to someone in our church through this. And there's a, there's a part in the Old Testament where God is leading the Israelites out of slavery, out of Egypt. And, and he says, so it says, sometimes God has to take you out to bring you back in. Y'all listening to me? We're going to get going right out of the gate here. I'm ready for it. I hope y'all are ready. 
Man, I've already preached like five times this week. So like, I'm just, I'm right. We had a student at Burlington Christian Academy get saved at chapel on Tuesday morning. I mean, it was awesome. And so like, I, I'm sitting here, I'm like, God, what, what, how can we take this? And he's like, sometimes I got to take you out. Come on, somebody. To bring you back in to see what I'm doing. And the church is not a building, it's a people. And we've experienced that here. It's been a great reminder. Like we, we've had like over 350 people every, most Sundays we've been here. Which is amazing. Like I, I, I knew we'd be down. I, I, I tried to guilt everybody. Like come to Providence Grove. Like oh it's an hour drive. I can't make it. It's just too much. And the kids all have kids ministry. I haven't heard. I mean you parents might be losing your mind. But I haven't been distracted by one kid in here this whole time. Right? I mean, God has just been faithful while we've been here. And so I'm, I'm sitting here and like, I just keep, want to remind us that we will do anything short of sin to reach people for Jesus Christ. And sometimes to reach people that aren't being reached, we have to do things that other people aren't doing. Not to try to be relevant for relevance sake, but to make sure we've done our part to spread the gospel to those that haven't heard it yet. And so, as we close up Maybe close up. I don't know. We'll just have to see, see where we sit and, and what God's doing. I and mean, we got an awesome series starting when we get back in our building. Um, on whatever it's, if it's October 6th or October 13th, I don't know. But man, we're, we're going to start this awesome series called Dumb Things Christians Believe. <laughs> Are y'all ready for that? Like, I am, I am so pumped. Dumb things that Christians believe. And so you're going to need to invite somebody to come with you. Invite the skeptics, invite the, the people that aren't saved, that want to make fun of your Christianity. I don't care. We're going to just have fun with it. But I don't know how much longer we're going to be in this. I don't know if it's today is the end, but, but we're going we're gonna to kind of have our time together today in this, in this idea of we, we've got to let go of loneliness. And I, I, I was thinking back to some of my favorite moments being a part of New Covenant Church. I, I've been a part of church my whole life. And I've, I've always loved church. I've always loved being around people. I'm a people person. I'm an extrovert. I'm not one of those pastors that's an introvert that has to like fake it on a Sunday morning. And I, I just love people. I love being around people. And like I, I just, my whole life, I just loved it. And, and I'm thinking back to some of my favorite moments over the last 11 and a half years. Almost 12, y'all. Two months will be 12 years since I've been here. Isn't that something? Yeah. I didn't even think about that, Lord. It's almost, it's almost October. Like, it's so crazy. But, but like, I, I, will, I will never forget how hard I laughed with Josh Law and Riley Bryan and Mike Bryan on a missions trip to the Dominican Republic. Can I say everything that was said up from this stage? No, I can't. But, man, I have never laughed so hard in my life. Riley Bryan came back and he told his mom, he said, man, I didn't know Pastor Josh could laugh that much. I just remember, man, it was just like the, the fellowship, man. I, I, I'll never forget like one of my favorite moments in, as a part of our life group that, that we're a part of. Like one, one Sunday evening, we're at, we're at the Steed's house, man. We're just sitting around and the, the football game had been on and the football game went off and an infomercial came on for like some pots and pans that, were, that would never stick, never damage because they were made with diamonds. You know what I'm saying? Like it's a diamond plated pot. And y'all, we made fun of these people on this infomercial for probably the, like good 30 minutes to an hour, laughing till we all cried, just having a good time being together. And I, I love some of, these, some of the moments that we've shared like at man camp, right? Where like sitting around the last year, I was sitting around till midnight talking, talking cars and mechanics with Will May or talking about smoking barbecue on a pellet smoker with Jonathan Faring, or everybody wondering how I'm still up at midnight playing cornhole when they usually ride by my house and it's 9 o'clock and all the lights are off. You know what I mean? Like, like just some of these, these moments. And I, and I think back and it's my favorite moments are always when we're, when we're together, when we're with each other. And I think, I think the thing like about church, like church growth experts... Come into churches and measure the health of the organization. One of the factors they use to determine health is how long people linger after a service. One of the things they measure to determine the health of a congregation is how long people linger and talk after a service. 
Which is why we're trying to push, especially at New Covenant, man, we got our, I've got a coffee cart, we got a great awning, like I know the services are back to back to back, but like, man, we've got, we want to try to push you out there and to hang out and talk and just do life together and stop just saying, hey, how are you? Like, I'm doing well. It's like, man, let's get down to how we can really pray for each other. Like, I, I had this thought, like, what if, what if like when the church service is over, like you want to stay in the room to keep talking? Or you, you find a group to go out to dinner with and after the check's been paid, you stay at the table because you love the conversation so much. Or when the, when the tears and the, the praying stops at the altar, the hugging just keeps on going and the, and the community just keeps on building. Harvard uh, did a study not too long ago and they found that one in three people believe that they have needs in their life that no one then they have no one to meet them. That they have hurts to share and nobody in their life to listen to the hurt. That they have love to give, but they have no one in their life to receive the love they have to offer. 36% of people endure ongoing feelings of loneliness, isolation, and longing to love and be loved... And constantly have this thought, something in my life is missing. Something's missing. I don't know if you feel that. I don't know if you ever have that thought in your mind. But you constantly walk through life and this thought enters and, and exits your mind frequently. Something is missing. Did you know that God never intended for you to have that thought? He, he never intended for you to feel that way. Loneliness, hopelessness, isolation was never in the picture. We, we can see it. In, in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 is, is a great place to start. In Genesis 1 1, God begins to create the heavens and the earth. Man, how, many, how long do they have till you get to Genesis in this Bible? All right, here we go. Genesis 1 1. I need, I need my countryman Mike, ear Mike back. I don't like holding this thing. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It goes on to tell us that he created light. Light was good. He created day and night, land and water, stars, plants, fish, birds, all the animals. He created all these things. And he said to every one of them, it was good. Everybody say, it was good. But then he said something wasn't good. How, like God in his perfection, almighty God, all powerful, which is, tells me it's okay to think it's like things aren't always good. Are y'all with me? <laughs> like sometimes they ain't good. Like sometimes we mess it up in here. Sometimes we mess it up as a church. Sometimes life is a wreck. Sometimes people just can't sing and they don't need to be up here. Sometimes people, like, you know, like it just happens. God looked at all he had created and he determined that something wasn't good. He creates Adam. He creates Adam in Genesis 2.18. He says this. Then the Lord God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. God, God determined that there was no one for Adam to share life with, to celebrate with, to cry with, to laugh with, to have joy with, to have meals with, to help when you need something, right? I mean, like, I don't, you, they always give these, you get a box of something, you get it shipped to your house, or you buy something new, and, and there's like the two people on it, it's a two-person lift situation, and there never seems to be the other person that can lift with you. God said, it's not good for man to be alone. Verse 22 and 23 of Genesis 2. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. At last, the man exclaimed, this one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. I mean, I think he saw Eve for the first time and said, whoa, man. That sounds good. We'll call her woman. That was free, y'all. <laughs> that was free. 
there's a, there's a key phrase in Genesis 1, 26 that you'll miss it. We'll skip right over it. It says, God said, let us make mankind in our own image, in our likeness. Who else is there? <laughs> like, what in the world? Let us? I mean, like, he's not created any other being. Nothing else is there. Who's he talking with? This is the moment right out of the gate, first chapter of the Bible, where God reveals the Holy Trinity. Where we get God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Now, I've heard tr people try to explain this and for people use like, you know, there's three properties of water and all these different things. But listen, like, I, I am not smart enough that you're going to find somebody else to explain this better than I can, okay? All I've got is that you've got three different persons all wrapped up also into one, right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God is creator, Jesus is savior, Holy Spirit testifies to the truth about the both of them. And they work in tandem together in order to help us live our life. Now, why would God create man if he already lived in a perfect community with two other beings? He created man because, like, not because he was lonely, but because he's love. God, God created Man, because God is love. God, love is just, it's not, it's not what God does, it's, it's who he is. That's what my Jesus said, the greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. They, they, they build on each other. Like you can't, you, you can't, look, you can't have one without, without the other. You can go to 1 John and read all about it. In 1 John 4, 16, it says, We know how much God loves us, and we put our trust in His love. God is love, and all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. From the very beginning, God never, never intended for man to be alone. Now, I, I know... I know that what we have in this very beginning of the book is the picture God placed in front of us for marriage. Where he created man, then he created woman, a suitable helper. You know, like, I'm, I'm just telling you, like, like, there's no replacement for, like, a marriage covenant between a man and a woman. And when it lives in perfect harmony and unity together under the umbrella of God Almighty, there is no other substitute for that. I don't care how far you've searched where you've searched and what you believe, but that is God's true intention for the covenant of marriage. Now, now, what we have to understand in light of this is that God said, be fruitful and multiply. Thank you, Jesus. And so now, now humanity begins to spread and it and, and then they sin and it's broken and, and God begins to, to create a, a rescue plan to bring his people back to him. And he sends Jesus to die. Jesus dies on the cross. He comes back to life to understand the truest version of the community of believers. We have to go to Acts. We've read it several times already while we've been here. But in Acts chapter 2, verses 46 through 47... We read what the early church did with one another. Here we go. It says, They worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. When we decide as individuals to truly operate like the church, physical proximity becomes emotional unity. Because I can tell you, just showing up is not enough. Physical proximity is not the complete answer. Physical proximity has to transform us into emotional unity. You would ask why they meet together so often. 
Why, why was it daily? You see, they lived in this time where, and, and, and there's this thing that's happening, it's been happening for several decades now all around the world, that the church, like Christianity is growing the fastest in the countries where it's illegal. Y'all hear that? Like North America, America especially, is in plateau and there's the early signs of decline. The, the gospel is being spread rapidly in areas around the world where Christianity is illegal. You'll die for, be thrown in prison for your faith. That is exactly what the early church faced right after Jesus came back to life. They needed each other desperately. They couldn't make it without one another. They were being persecuted. They were being uh, beaten. And they were just praying together. They were sharing meals and miracles. They cried. They rejoiced. And it says they did it all in spite of how hard it was that they did it with glad and sincere hearts. There's nothing to me that seems joyful about the threat of being killed for being a Christian. And yet it spread rapidly. The 3,000 people got saved on the first day. And it says the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And so we, we understand that in, in the face of extreme persecution... The first century believers desperately needed each other and they knew it. Believers today, especially in America, desperately need each other and we've forgotten it. It's been said that people are constantly seeking autonomy and independence. The flow of our culture now is to do life without intimacy. And social media, we're able to observe people's lives without an intimate connection with them. I want to work from home. I want a hassle-free schedule. I want hassle-free relationships. The problem with that life is there is limited or no accountability whatsoever. We shop online. We bank online. We watch sermons online. And so many people are intentionally pursuing a life that is literally destroying your mental health. Because it's robbing you of lasting joy... And like this real fulfillment that only comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ that is supplemented by other people. Church, God never intended for you to feel lonely. God never intended for us to observe people's lives without truly having a connection with them. And I, I will never forget for my entire life, the rest of my life, I will never forget. Now I know my position, like I'm in a position where I stand in front of you guys every week and like everybody knows Josh, right? So I get it. So when I got hurt, I mean, it was like this outpouring of love and support. Like when I got hit by that tree, man, I was like, I, I woke up out of the, of, of the fog that night in the ER and my phone had over 100 missed text messages from all these people that had heard about it. Like about 50 of them, listen, about 50 of them were from my life group where Keisha had texted all of them to pray and all of them were constantly texting prayers, getting, trying to get updates on how I was doing and if I was okay. Another 30 or 40 of them was from a group text I have with some guys in this church. They know who they are. And it was just... Josh, we're praying for you. Are you good, dude? Can, do you need anything? All right, it just turned into this. Like, I, and, I, and I get to these points, and I, and I look at people's lives, and I say, I don't know how people make it without a community of faith around them. I don't know how people make it. Which is why our church is built on this, this idea that we want to help as many people as we can follow Jesus, find community, and make a difference. But it's my opinion, and I, and I probably would say it's the fact that you, like, I don't think you can truly follow Jesus without ha finding other people to come alongside you to do it with you together. Are y'all with me today? 
Did y'all realize that there are, in, in the New Testament, there are 59 one another verses. 59 one another's. To name a couple, serve one another. Galatians 5, 13. Show hospitality to one another. 1 Peter 4, 9. Be kind to one another. That's a good one. Ephesians 4, 32. Encourage one another. 1 Thessalonians 4, 18. Carry one another's burdens. Galatians 6, 2. So what does a true community of believers look like? America's been getting, and I keep, I'm, I'm just, I'm telling you the reality. Especially in the South. We've been getting it wrong for a really long time. We have this mentality in church world that in order for you to belong to us, then you're going to have to believe first. After you've believed in Jesus, we want to see you become a faithful follower of Jesus and clean up all your junk and your skeletons in your closet. Then we'll consider letting you belong here. Anybody tracking with me on that? That there's this feeling that, that somehow you have to believe first, you got to become next, and then we'll think about letting you belong to the group. That's backwards. That's not, that's not anywhere in the Bible. It's actually completely opposite. Man, we want you to belong. Don't you feel like you're at home? Whether you, what, no matter what mess you've got in your life, no matter who you are, what you've done, what you did last night, like it doesn't matter. We want you to belong here, to feel at home here, whether you've put your faith in Jesus yet or not, whether you have started to become anything or not. Like you don't have to have anything together to come and be a part. Like there is no perfect people allowed at this church. Can I tell you that? Amen. And that's the way Jesus intended it. Remember we read it. It's not the healthy that need a doctor, it's the sick. So belong here. And then I hope that by us doing this one another thing the right way, then you'll believe. Because there's nowhere in the Bible that says you have to transform or become anything before you trust Jesus with your life. And then he comes in and transforms you into a brand new person. And it's only through his power and the power of the Holy Spirit that you and I can become what he's intended for us to be. So because of God's grace, we as the church are an extension of that grace. Which means this is a safe place. You're welcome with your questions. You're welcome with your doubts. You're welcome with your hurt, your addiction, your baggage, your depression, your worry, your anxiety, with your mess, with your brokenness, with your hopelessness, with your loneliness. You are welcome here because we are an extension of God's grace that says, I don't care who you are or what you've done. I died on the cross for every single one of you, and I want you to make your way to heaven one day when you die. That's the truth of the gospel. So there's, there's two things that happen when we gather. There's probably a lot more I could list, but I want to list two. The first one is, there's healing when we gather. James 5, 16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Church, the Bible's clear, God forgives your sin. When you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and you rate God raised him from the dead and you say, Jesus, I'm sorry for what I've done. I know I'm missing the mark. I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm in need of your grace. I trust that the truth of your word says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I don't care how good I think my life is. I need your grace. He forgives us. But then James takes it a step further and he says, if you want to be healed of anything that's in your life, then we have to come to each other and gather together for healing. Say, hey, I need you to come and step up and help lead me out of this. I need your help. I need you to encourage me. I need you to talk me out of this pit that I'm in. To be able to stand together and to fight together and to say, we are in this together. And I found a group of people among our church that I can do life with, that I can, I can text back and forth with throughout the day and, and text worship songs and quotes from things we hear and Bible verses and just encouragement, sprinkle in a couple of funny, not inappropriate videos that you might want to share with one another, right? 
And I'm thankful. I, I am so, like, man, I'm thankful for, for some of the, the texts and groups I'm a part of. I never have to worry that somebody's going to send me something that I know God does not intend for me to see. If, you, if you're a part of something like that and you want to take that oath that Job basically said, I, I, did, I have made a covenant with God that I will not look at anything in my, with my eyes that would be inappropriate, that would take away the intimacy and break it with him. You need to exit that. You got to get out of it. Like you are, you'll become who you hang out with. You'll become who you spend your time with. Show me your friends. I'll show you your future. I don't have the time, the energy, or the effort, or the mental capacity to be a part of something for very long that's going to take away my intimacy with Jesus Christ. I need people to lift me up, to encourage me, and to bring, bring God into my life and help me understand that we're in this together.